theatre sits in particular places. If it's not in those spaces, then you run the risk of people saying, oh, that's not really theatre, Dave. The theatre is for the audience. What we want to do is to take theatre to people who maybe haven't seen theatre before. You weren't always feeling 100% about how you may be perceived by people in the audience. The world has gotten smaller. We're more aware of the conflicts that we share. Has it touched someone in some way that they're going to think differently about maybe now how they live their life? How do we bring people with us? You can change the law all you want, but that doesn't necessarily change the world. Those issues don't become something you just read about. You're seeing somebody else's life on that stage. It's a way to say, OK, the world's like this. Fair enough, but the world doesn't have to be like this. I grew up in London. My parents were Irish immigrants. My mother was from County Mayo. My father was from Limerick. We lived in a house where four Irish families all lived in the same house. We lived in one room in a kitchen. I was born in London, classic Irish immigrants. My parents left Waterford in 53. Uh, went to London. I was born in 55 and my sister was born a bit later and we came back in the winter of 59-60 and settled in Waterford where I grew up. I think when I was in primary school I wrote a story about the moon and that the moon was talking to me. <laughs> we had a chat with the moon and because I remember actually when I, the house that we grew up in I used to go to the, you know, the room where the toilet was and stand on the toilet and look out the window a lot there and see all the lights in other people's houses and wonder what was going on in people's, you know, the stories that were behind those windows, those lights. My mother had a great interest in what used to be known as the tops of the town. Industrial uh, factories and shops and businesses would have had variety show playoffs. We got to the Gaiety in Dublin a couple of times uh, for the Waterford Glass Factory. She also sang in pubs, was a powerfully uh, good singer. And so there's a performative dimension in the house growing up. I was reared in a, in a state like Chantalo and uh, there would have been um, people in and out with stories of the day, news of the day, and it was a regular uh, feature of our of my life growing up uh, in Waterford. In the street where I grew up, you know, the children would all play out in the street and I would gather up the children and make stories with them. So we'd make ghost stories and I'd say, right, you're that person, you're that person. And now there's a secret passageway here and there's, you know, a secret tunnel here. and It's a dungeon, and, you know, so we'd make up these stories. And I'd be kind of like telling them all what to do. I knew that I wanted to work in theatre from a young age. My mum didn't want me to do it. So I suppose to put it out of my mind then for a while and I was doing all these other jobs. And then when I was, when I was 25, I thought, what do I want to do with my life? <laughs> And then I remembered, I thought, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in theatre. So I joined this, like, community, um, community theatre company, community drama group. After uh, a kind of uh, not massively successful university degree at UCD, I went overseas for four years in uh, Borneo, in Malaysia, in the state of Sabah, and then in the Gambia, in West Africa. And when I came back then, I was kind of checking myself out as to what do I do now, how do I get a job? I wasn't going to go overseas again, though I had job offers. And I went to St. Pat's Teacher Training College. I took part in a, a student production of John Millington Singh's The Rider to the Sea, and I played the dead guy. <laughs> I was carried on. So I had no lines. I just had to stop breathing for a short period at the end. And people would say it's my finest ever role. Uh, so I think that was the first formal theatrical thing I was involved in. Uh, then when I came to Derry, I, I was involved in informal street theatre performance. Now, I was writing all the time through this. Short fiction, poetry, song lyrics, uh, all the time. So I had a... a an understanding that theatre was a place that I, I might uh, find a way of expressing myself and find a way of explaining myself to myself and the world to myself and connect with the world in a more formal way. The next thing I was involved in was with um, Levener's Art Space. It was based on a true story of a young black South African man who um, had planted a bomb in a bin and he'd got caught. And this play was toured all around the UK. We took it to prisons, community centres, schools. It was actually in that play that too, I played Margaret Thatcher in that. Nobody cares more than I about the situation in South Africa. First time I came to Derry was 
It was through the Leavener's Art Space, who had done the play about South Africa. So then I applied to do a degree here um, with University of Ulster, and I did theatre and media studies. I'd read a lot about Northern Ireland, I'd watched a lot of documentaries, I was very interested in what was happening in Northern Ireland. A quarter of a century ago, our society ground to a halt in and around a standoff between local residents and a loyal order marching uh, organisation in Drum Creek. And the standoff there, the unresolved issues there, spilt over all across our society, including in the city of Derry here. So uh, I could have joined a committee, I could have joined a march, I could have uh, uh, become part of a political movement. I wrote a play. I wrote a play called The Shopper and the Boy. Uh, and I went looking for money to try and fund uh, the production. And I had the good fortune to meet Maureen Hetherington, who was working for the council at the time. She, I'm pleased to say, had the vision, wit, sagacity to say, yeah, we'll do this. And in, in the early days, it was very, very hard to get people to engage with each other because of the deep segregation across the city and deeply segregated uh, schooling and that. Um, and we needed ways in which people could have the opportunities to hear other perspectives, almost rehumanize the perceived enemy. And Dave came along with an idea of putting on a play that might uh, use um, drama as a way of tackling some of those difficult political issues. And then I went and got two actors. And I got a chap called Darren Greer from Eglinton. And I got a woman called Patricia Byrne, uh, who was in town at the time, recently graduated from uh, Coleraine, from the University of Coleraine. The Shopper and the Boy uh, is a dramatic clash between a member of a loyal order, the Apprentice Boys of Derry, and a, a local resident, uh, a woman, going shopping for a school uniform. And it, they explain their own lives, as it were, and their circumstances on the day. The Apprentice Boy is uh, has enjoyed the 11th night and is about to enjoy the mart and uh, uh, the mother uh, is out and is looking uh, uh, to shop for a uniform for her secondary school kid. The set is a big stretch of purple cloth laid along the floor, uh, pulled out of a trunk and they appear on either side of it and the length of cloth is the river and they move up and down on their own side of the river, as it were, and then at the very end they cross. Uh, and the clash happens, and it breaks down at the end. And then the two performers hand the matter to uh, the audience. It was taking a risk because marching at that time was such a difficult issue to tackle, uh, and it was very... Uh, interest in the way that um, people ha held very firmly held beliefs. We have an absolute right to march and other people saying we have a right to go about our daily business. So this was just a very creative way of trying to hear the different perspectives and the complexities. But in the way that it was presented, it wasn't confrontational. It was just trying to get people to hear maybe a different story that they might never have heard before. Afterwards, uh, a number of people, uh, Pat and Darren included, and myself saying, oh, there's a gig in this. So a series of conversations emerged, central to which were myself and Pat and some others, uh, about forming a, a, a company and making, uh, quotes and quotes, a living out of this. It crystallised out very early that only uh, Pat and I were in a position or really wanted to do this thing, commit to doing this. Other people had other jobs, they had other interests, they didn't see where they would go and so on and so on. So Pat and I uh, uh, formed a cooperative partnership which we named Sole Purpose Productions and we went through the processes of forming it into a, a company uh, with co-op principles and we began the process of the next play, getting more money and engaging with people like the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, the city council, trust funds. And so that's the origins of the company are those meetings and an affirmation by myself and Pat Byrne that on the back of the play, The Shopper and the Boy, there was something we could do more.
when we started the company, it was mainly Dave's plays that we, we were producing because those were the plays that were, were the peace process plays. So there was The Shopper and the Boy, Without the Wars, which is about policing, and Waiting, which was about um, uh, political prisoners being released. When we did The Shopper and the Boy, then there were, you know, groups that were working in peace and reconciliation that were booking performances and the workshop afterwards. So the workshop afterwards was like an interactive theatre workshop where we worked with groups. Um, and that style of theatre seemed to work very well for us and for working with groups and communities. And we wanted to continue doing that. I worked with them much more closely, sort of between 1997 and about 2008, 2009, uh, when I acted for the company. You know, and we, we toured and we, we, we were everywhere. We were in England, we were in America, we were all over Ireland. Doing shows like Waiting, which was about prisoners and victims, and The Shop and the Boy, which was about parading, uh, and Without the Walls, which was about policing. You know, and these were hot topics, 97, 98, 99, 2000. It wasn't, you know, you weren't always feeling 100% about some of the venues you might have been going into in terms of in terms of how you may be perceived by people in the audience. I learned a lot from Soul Purpose by doing that because I kind of saw that basically if you create the right environment then you can say what you want and sometimes you can say the most outrageous things in front of a community but you're turning around and you're saying like, you know, this is, this is, we're just putting that up to people to see what they think. I'm trying hard to make a waiting environment. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for you to begin again. There was one time we were in New York um, and we were doing uh, Waiting, which is the one about the prisoners and victims, and we performed it when we were at Columbia University. You know, and we were asked to talk about experiences and being from Northern Ireland, and I mentioned the point that sometimes there was people there at the breakfast table who weren't there at tea time, and that's the way it happened. And a girl sort of walked up and walked across the front and out and what have you. You just kind of think, you know, that's... That's somebody just doesn't want to be there, and yet one of our lecturers came to us afterwards and said that her brother had been in one of the towers on 9/11. So, you know, even with a statement like that, it resonates out. So therefore, there is a kind of universality uh, about all these stories: pain, suffering, loss. They're all they all exist in that space. Dave Duggan had written a play, Waiting. And they came over to perform this piece at the Minor Latham Playhouse. So it was a riveting piece. Uh, and it really opened so many of the students' eyes to the peace and reconciliation process of Northern Ireland um, in a new way. And, you know, most importantly, they were accessible after the play. Um, they did a Q&A, the actors, um, Dave and Pat were around to talk with students in the theater classes. And um, I think, you know, when you have that kind of accessibility to the theater makers themselves, it really has a, a, an impact on especially young theater makers. D it demystifies the process, right? And, and I think that that's what Pat has continued to do for all of these years. The conjunction between us is one of uh, like-minded theater makers, like-minded artists. The work exists in a particular tradition, a particular style, a particular set of forms, but the combining factor is an affirmation of the pleasures and powers of making theatre. People watching other people act out something uh, in a, an imagined space. Theatre in general in Ireland sits in particular places. It tends to be metropolitan, uh, 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 and it tends to be in the cities and in designated spaces. If it's not in those spaces, then you run the risk of people saying, oh, that's not really theatre, Dave, right? So to assert that you can take a play, two actors who get paid, who get looked after, and a writer-director who gets paid and looked after, you can take that to a barn somewhere or an upstairs room in a pub and uh, call it theatre. And very definitely present artistic work. It's uh, Giuliano Mir Camis. My mother was Israeli, and my father was Palestinian. So I tried both sides. 
I joined the Israeli parachuters, and after three years, I tried to join the Palestinian Liberation Organization. The Freedom Theatre is in Janine refugee camp in the north of Palestine, and they wanted to form a theatre that would take the Palestinian narrative of what was happening on the ground out to the outside world, as well as um, build a theatre engineering camp which would um, train uh, young people in all forms and all areas of arts. Pat, for me, is such a legend and such an inspiration because she has relentlessly tried to bring work from the Freedom Theatre across many years and I think that that, that fight and that solidarity um, says such a huge thing about who she is and what she's built here in the last 25 years. I think specifically to the, for the Freedom Theatre it's a way um, of uh, fighting against the occupation and the um, oppression that people are experiencing there from Israel from the Palestinian perspective. We could feel the bullets firing all around us in every direction. I was shot in the arm, but there were no hospital or ambulances, so people just bandaged me up and we continued to move from house to house. As each home was bombed or bulldozed, the ground Janine camp was destroyed, and there was nowhere to go. The reason that I'm here and not the team in Palestine is because of the travel restrictions, because it is becoming harder and harder to leave the West Bank. The Revolution's Promise is specifically about building artist solidarity and about um, getting these testimonies together that other groups of people will read within their own communities, um, theatre organisations, solidarity groups, in order that in a way we create a bit of a wave. They have started to target me personally, taking steps towards revoking my residency, repressing me with travel bans. The worst was when my late mother was undergoing surgery for cancer in Jordan. I wasn't allowed to leave to be with her. The Minister of Intelligence at a public conference in front of 200 people and the world's cameras threatened me with civil assassination. But that is part of the price that all Palestinians pay. Part of our resistance. They are telling us, you can't boycott Israel. So what do you want us to do? You don't want us to do armed resistance and you don't like our non-violent resistance. What do you want us to do? Theatre to me, I guess, is an opportunity to step into another world, to step into another life, to hear a story that maybe otherwise you wouldn't have the opportunity to hear. The gay community have set up a support group, a strike fund, Lesbians and gays support the minors. How does that sound? <laughs> when it comes to issues that impact on LGBTQI plus people, people like me, activists and campaigners, often look through the lens of legislative change. But another really important aspect of it is hearts and minds. How do we bring people with us? How do we achieve sustainable change? Because you can change the law all you want, but that doesn't necessarily change the world. And I think for LGBTQI plus people, there are many of our stories that have been told through a theater and wider creative arts uh, that otherwise people wouldn't have heard, people wouldn't have seen. One of the things about Soul Purpose and Pat is they've been telling this story for going on three decades at this point. They have always stood in solidarity with the LGBTQI plus community. They told me, that you were seriously injured in a fight in Floyd Street, given out safer sex packs to men crazy in the park. Gay measures, that's who done it. I told you it was dangerous, but you wouldn't listen to me. They work so intensely with local communities and with the Rainbow Project to really hear those stories, understand those stories. It really takes someone with Pat's vision and integrity to really turn that story into something that someone else wants to watch that changes people's minds, that changes people's perspectives. Soul Purpose Productions would take issues and tackle really difficult areas of, of, and themes that we might not otherwise be able to have a good conversation about. A community that is struggling with its own identity, struggling with maybe issues of poverty. There's a whole lot of areas that need to be addressed if you want to have peace and reconciliation and justice and mercy and compassion. So it's not just about trying to deal with uh, you know, the tribal politics, but all of the other things that feed into that. The first play that I produced for Soul Purpose Productions was 
play called Under the Carpet, which was about um, was about sexual abuse within a family. So the um, things I was working on were kind of like looking at other issues because I didn't really feel me having an English accent coming from England that it was my place to write stuff around Northern Ireland. In 2004, then I produced Don't Say a Word, which is about domestic violence, which was, uh, that was a one-woman play. It was directed by Shauna Kelpie, and we toured that for about 10 years. I must have gone to every, you know, every nook and cranny all around Ireland, you know, small community centres, theatres, you know, we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It shows how, how the woman gets into the relationship, how it gradually changes, you know, how it gradually changes, it begins to get a bit controlling, you know, and then it gets... As it goes on, it gets more violent. So it shows how that ha can happen subtly in a relationship. And it was the, the, the purpose of that was to illustrate the signs of a, of a situation of domestic violence. So someone who's sitting in the audience, who's in that situation, can recognise the signs and can say, that's happening to me. And, um, and can do something about it. At times on the honeymoon, I found Paul to be a bit moody. He would seem to get angry with me over little things like if I wanted to go for a swim, he didn't want me to go by myself, so I had to wait until he wanted to go. I suppose he was being protective. I think for me, one of the key things in the development process is that Pat came and sat in on training that we delivered to professionals. She had discussions with myself and with others in Women's Aid about what uh, these stories were like, because we were representing those women and families um, that were using the services or, or, or what we know also about the prevalence of domestic abuse and the types of characteristics and behaviours that go with it. So that background uh pre-production, you know, preparing for to even tell that story was really important because if that story doesn't ring true and if that preparation isn't done and if someone like Pat and that uh, and the company don't absorb that information and understand it, then it's very hard for them to produce something that will ring true to an audience. And we will have people in the audience who have that experience. Well, I'm getting feedback about the work. I kind of look at the feedback from the people that are in the audience or, or the partner organisations that we've worked with about whether they think it did what they wanted it to do. You know, has it got the message across? Has it got people thinking, talking? Is it raising awareness? Has it touched someone in some way that they're going to think differently about maybe now how they live their life? You know, um, to me, those things, that's, that's kind of why I'm doing it. That's kind of what's important. We were in this community centre in Cavan and it was way out in the middle of nowhere. It was kind of like an older audience there, and I was thinking they won't be enjoying this, they'll be bored with it. After the performance, a woman came up to me, she was probably in her 70s, and she was a country woman, very strong country woman's handshake, and she was shaking my hand. And uh, she said, that was my life. You know, and that could have been the first time that her experience had ever been validated, that she'd ever seen her experience um, validated in that way and maybe she hadn't even spoken about it before. The arts take risks. They are a risky business. That's what they're in the, that's what they're doing. Um, pushing boundaries all the time, challenging preconceptions, um, trying to strip away prejudices and expose um, the human condition in all its flaws and in all its greatness. Sole purpose reflects uh, a huge diversity of issues close to people's experiences. Um, you know, anything from I don't know, domestic violence, LGBT plus rights, climate change, uh, the migrant um, experience, you know, the stigma surrounding mental health and suicide issues, and so on. And of course, the very bloodied, troubled history of, of Derry itself, with Dave Duggan's famous play on the Savile Inquiry. There was a lull. Not a lull. A hush. Just the briefest of hushes, as if, as if God put a finger to his lips and went, shh. Then maybe he took it away because it all began again. Birds, lorries, feet, dogs, bullets, and the man calling. So I crouched down and went in. Scenes from an inquiry, which I'm delighted to say, sole purpose and Pat uh, brought back uh, in 
2022 as part of our Theatre for Social Change Festival, uh, and I'm grateful to her for that, uh, was a particular instance of uh, real events, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry in the Guildhall here in the city of Derry, and my reflections upon it, my uh, reaction to it, uh, I felt there was a dearth of the emotional life of the witnesses, and thus uh, I wanted to provide witnesses to create an experience for audiences uh, that would allow further reflection on a big issue of state violence, truth recovery, uh, uh, recovery for individuals, trauma, all those matters to be uh, experience in the theatrical arena. But you can't take me back to the streets, the day, the sights and the smells, the way, the way people gathered, ran, stood amazed, the way the horror flowed out like a delta. You said you heard three shots. Can we locate them? <laughs> Memory can't be flattened by pointing at it. It has dimensions in time and space. But I think you'll find that looking at the maps... No, no your maps you are for spreading on big screens and on neat tables. Your maps have no, no depth, no mud, no blood, no fear. I n never, in sole purpose, presented realism. You know, people would say, uh, Dave, that's not real. And I go, exactly, it's theatre. So we present two or three characters or whatever the number is, and they are imagined beings. They are not, oh, that's your man, <laughs> that's your woman. They are manifestations of humanity in particular circumstances. And people say, it's not real. Of course it's not. It's a play. I think it would be naive of me at this stage, having worked in the theatre now for nearly 30 years in this town, to think that, you know, knowing where a story was going was not going to speak to some and alienate others. My hope is that basically people can sit and watch it and then discuss afterwards and find that place, that shared place where all voices can be heard, you know, and all experiences shared. Because again, without that, I don't think we very much hope. You know, the problem that you have with telling an individual a voice, a biographical story, is it just becomes the property of that one person. And I think then what that stops you doing is actually allowing that to reach out because that, that story is their property and you're not able to kind of dis, you know, deconstruct it the way you might want to. I have fictional characters, wheel away at them. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's what they're there for. When people say, is it any good or is it any bad or everything, I would say, judge it as a play, not as a piece of the world in a kind of ordinary or day-to-day uh, uh, -day sense. Does it work as a play? Did you walk in, watch it, believe the two figures in front of you? Did you follow their story, on, get a sense of what their dramatic tensions were, and see some kind of an outcome that left you satisfied, pleased, uh, confused, emotionally moved? From my perspective, the theatre is for the audience. What we want to do with our theatre is to take theatre to people who maybe haven't seen theatre before. They might say theatre's not for me, if we take it into a community centre or into a school or we take it somewhere and then they see this piece of theatre that actually relates to their own lives and it matters to them and it's about something they care about, then to me it's, it's, it's achieved its purpose. I'm not a fan of art for art's sake, um, which is, 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 is good and it has its own values and all that, but it's not something really that I want to do. Somebody will always have a view on um, whether that was um, the right thing or um, whether it was offensive or and our view on that is as long as it's within the law it is you know if somebody wants to create a bit of work that should be presented or is presented as long as it's within the legal framework that our society in general has to adhere to then that is the proper purview of an Arts Council to support work if it's good. Hundreds and thousands and millions of people came out on the streets of Tunisia, of Libya, of Egypt, of Syria, of Yemen, of Iraq, of Lebanon. Revolutionary songs that have for decades been buried under the soil reduced to whispers were echoing through every liberation in Tahrir Square from Cairo to Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut to Sana'a. I've always, since I was a child, I've always, you know, wanted to be at the forefront of bringing 
uh, you know, justice to the world, you know, because I grew up also witnessing so much injustice. At first, you know, I watched lots of Hollywood films and I thought I'm going to be this great lawyer that, you know, that is going to be out there defending the underdog, you know. But uh, in the end, I ended up being, uh, working in the, in the in actually in the world of the non-governmental organization world, with grassroots movements, with like uh, human rights and uh, organizations. But it was just too serious, too dry, too heavy and too painful for me. And I could not, I could not. Um, deal with the world uh, it's, it's through, with so much seriousness. So I was like, okay, the only way to do it is to do it playfully and creatively. It's just a tapestry of these uh, stories to, you know, kind of show a glimpse of these last 20, 20 years from the perspective of someone who uh, was ra born and raised in Baghdad, migrated to Beirut, then to, to Europe, to Berlin, and then to Britain. Hello, Baba. Baba, Habibi. Baba. Baba, Baba, she told me that you were kidnapped. Baba, are, are you okay? Baba, what happened? What, what, what happened? Where, where are you now? Are, are, you, are you safe? What's going on? It's a way to say, okay, the world is like this. Fair enough. But the world doesn't have to be like this. And it's not out of naivete that I say that. It's out of a sense of, I, uh, I don't necessarily need to accept that the world is this way. It is this way. Fair enough. But it can also be different. And this is how we can make it different. You need Iskat al nidam al-Shaab. You need Iskat al nidam al-Shaab. You need Iskat al nidam Working practice for me and Pat is extraordinary. We had a, a day book, we wrote things down, messages. We met every week, uh, wrote things up, we had charts. I'll do this, you do that, we do this. It was an extremely fruitful and productive uh, working relationship at a day-to-day at -day level. So uh, at one of those meetings I said, Pat, uh, this time next year I will be out of sole purpose productions and I, I'd like us to begin to have that conversation. So we spent a year having that conversation. Various options emerged as to what could happen. Shut the company down, bring somebody else in. Pat continue on her own. Pat chose the third option and has made a huge success of it since. I learned a lot from working with Dave in running the administration side of the company, the things that need to be done, working with groups, working with communities. Most of the working practice now has come from those, those early years and how we worked together and what I learned from Dave, you know, through those years. So when Dave left, we moved into St. Columns Hall in the basement, we were downstairs for a couple of years and then moved into the new refurbished playhouse. And now, yeah, I've got have an office in the playhouse on the third floor and it's been great to be in, you know, in a, a very active arts and cultural centre. As I moved on then, there were plays I'd written myself, but also I was working with other writers as well and producing their work. So the plays that I've done for Sole Purpose Productions would have been then Every Move You Make, which was about abusive relationships among young people. Because when we were doing Don't Say a Word, many people would have said to us, you know, this is happening among young people as well. And young people, there was someone who told me that she'd come to see Don't Say a Word with her daughter and they were walking home and the daughter said, yeah, but that doesn't happen in our age group, does it? Um, but it was happening more and more. So, so then I did kind of an adapted version of Don't Say a Word for a younger audience. Where was that? Oh yeah, I was talking about how Jamie's always texted me. So one weekend we were away for my mum's birthday, we went down to see my aunt. And I think he must have texted me about 20 times. That's him again. My relationship with Pat then continued when I went to work with the NSPCC. It focused more on, I suppose, towards a younger age, around those kind of relationships that are happening at a younger age, uh, and what are now what we would call healthy or unhealthy relationships, and spotting those early warning signs. And for us, again, it was really important that she reflected that true story for, again, that, that those behaviours, what are they like? What is that process like when someone begins to realise a relationship may be really unhealthy and, in fact, very harmful to them and how difficult that can be? And I think she also captured that uh, subtlety around a relationship that can feel very loving but then becomes smothering and becomes not good for you. When we were performing Every Move You Make in school, so there was a young woman who'd seen it, and, and her mother contacted me, I think a few months later, to say my daughter had seen your play in school, and she was in a, a situation, an abusive relationship, but it was very difficult to talk to her about it, because um, she was afraid she would push her daughter away, or her daughter would you know, move away from her if she was 
she was going to challenge her about this. But the daughter came around talking about the play and this happened in it and that happened in it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then that gave her a way to talk to her daughter about what was happening in her own relationship because her mother could see that it was abusive, that she was not being treated well. And, um, but the, the daughter couldn't see it. It's Sophie. Why do you want to know? She's just asking if I'm coming around to her house tomorrow. We're going to work on a city together for school. I don't think it quite fully occurred to me that my relationship in itself was abusive. I think every move you make helped me start to see things. Like, I was watching the play and there was things I was looking at and I was comparing it against my relationship and being like, you know, is this what's happening to me? Um, but I think I was still in that, you know, denial phase of, no, no, my relationship's fine, it's nothing like this. I think I knew there were certain things to me that didn't seem right. Like, the not having any of my own friends because any of my own friends that I did have ended up being pushed away. So it meant then I had this massive anxiety that if we did break up, I wouldn't have any of my own friends. Um, because I knew it was very likely that no matter what anyone said, they were all going to flock to her side and I wouldn't have any friends anymore. I watched my daughter become withdrawn, reclusive, um, isolated. You didn't have a support circle of your own. You, you like stopped going to drama, stopped doing the things that you really loved, stopped hanging out with people that you really liked. And it was hard, really hard to watch that happen. My aunt was starting to get really annoyed. But it just worries about me. She says it's possessive. But we're crazy about each other. Whenever she came in talking about this play, it was this, okay, right, there's a marker, that's something that I can I can use as a tool. That's, that's something I can talk about, that we can talk about. It was a great way to have that conversation with you. Seeing every move you make definitely changed my life, I guess. It meant I could move out of one very unhealthy relationship and and see that I was worth more than that and work on myself so that I was more secure in myself and wouldn't let that happen to me again. We use theatre a lot in our work with young people particularly um, because we know it helps externalise those issues. They don't become something you just read about. You're seeing somebody else's life on that stage, perhaps your own. It unlocks something different in an audience to just go in and tell them about a subject, even ask them things, they write it down. A play really embodies and can and cannot, it can be, you know, for some people life-changing and that they recognise they need support or they recognise they weren't alone, that this experience is shared in the wider community and that might be validation in itself. Yeah. Ryan, how come you're not at work today? Well, it wasn't needed. You know, I'm not getting the business these days, ma, you know. Here, I'm making some tea and toast. Do you want some? No. Are you alright? Yeah, fine. Are you sure? Yeah. Sure? <laughs> ma. Ma has anxiety. No, she worries. Her mother was killed during, or during the Troubles. Shot in crossfire. It happened when I was a baby. Like, Ma never talks about it, ever. Apparently she's never been the same since. We took Blinkered to New York in 2019, and we did the play in the City University of New York with Kat Kavanagh for the Origin Theatre's first Irish theatre festival. Kat Kavner, we had actually worked with, I think it was like 17 years beforehand, when we took the play Waiting, which was Dave's play, to Columbia University. In 2018, at the end of the school year, I said in a faculty meeting, there is really a rise in teen suicide and suicide in college students. And I want to propose that we do something about this. I don't know what it is yet, 
Maybe we'll create a play for next season, but I just want to throw this out there now. I just had this compelling need, even though I didn't have a plan. Three weeks later, Pat calls me up and says, I have a play about suicide that we're bringing to New York in January. How would you like to be a part of it? I mean, it was nuts. And then six months later, we're doing it. I interviewed people who had attempted to take their own life. And I interviewed people who had lost a son or a daughter through suicide. I wanted to know as, as much as possible about the issue. And I wanted to know as much as possible from different perspectives to people that had been affected by the issue in different ways. When I work on a piece, then I would maybe do a first draft of a script and then I would give it to someone in the organisation that I'm working with to give me feedback on it. See, I didn't do very well at school. I was bullied. I was quiet, you know, I didn't mix well. And uh, there was horrible comments on Facebook all the time. You know, saying things about you that you didn't do or say, you know, turning people against you. <laughs> So I spent a lot of time on my own school. I was lonely! Woo. I remember when I was writing Blinkards, one of the people that I was working with was Bridie Sheridan, who was working in Youth Life. And when I did the first draft, the young man in the play um, had attempted suicide, but he'd, he'd survived. And when I showed the script to Bridie Sheridan, she wasn't very pleased with it. <laughs> She said, well, it's not about suicide, then it's about self-harm. So then I rewrote the play so that he does actually take his own life. And she told me a story that she'd been working with a young man and his brother had died by suicide. And she said to him, what do you think people need to know? And he said, I think they need to know what they leave behind them. So um, so in the play Blinkered then, the young man does take his own life and we see the impact on the family afterwards. For me as an educator, as a professor of theatre, what really tells the story is when you ask students to write a critical paper about the experience, not just a critique of the play, but what was the experience um, that you had in the theater from the moment you hit the door, how are you changed by this story? So in fact, I did collect uh, many letters which I sent to Pat Byrne after Blinkered. The students, wrote these letters and, and wrote um, papers saying how affected they were, that um, they had had people in their families who had either died by suicide or that they had had similar thoughts and hadn't been able to tell other people. Brian, what have you done? What was it? What was wrong? Why couldn't you tell me if I was, I'm your big sister? I was always here for you. I think this genre of theater is critical, especially now, more than ever. You know, the world has gotten smaller. We're more aware of each other's conflicts. We're more aware of, of the conflicts that we share within our countries. Yes, you know, I have taken to the streets with my children. We march every chance we get and we write letters and we talk to politicians, but there is nothing like being in a dark theater with hundreds of strangers watching the same story unfold and seeing how a family has been affected, either by gun violence, by suicide, by domestic violence, all of these issues that have been taboo for so long are now coming to light and being illuminated on our stages. And I think that it potentially changes the world. I really, truly believe that. Blinkered is an extraordinary play that has been well received not just as it's toured in schools across Northern Ireland or the Republic but in America. You know that's fantastic. Uh, we have small-scale theatre companies here of which Sole Purpose is a fine example that travel 
and punch well above their weight elsewhere, not just in Northern Ireland, but elsewhere, because of the, the way in which their practice is embedded, it's rooted in local communities, their needs and their issues as they arise and as those change. Theatre for Social Change, because of the cost, can be marginalised to see something that can only be done now and again. I think we're underusing our performers, our artists, our creators of social theatre because unfortunately as we know the, that the arts sector is really hard hit by any financial constraints because those are the first budgets that go. I think it's critically important but I don't think it is critically resourced at the level it should be. It needs to stay and be enhanced. The benefit of the arts to people's emotional, mental health and well-being is something that the health service is aware of. All the evidence shows that. But, you know, the health budget needs to recognise that and, and, and maybe, you know, put some more funding into socially prescribed arts to value the outcomes of the arts in terms of health and well-being. There's no argument to be made there anymore. It's proven. Educating a young person, if they have access to the arts, gives them confidence, brings skills, enables them to have you know, stronger interpersonal relationships, um, helps their education in the broader sense. We know all of this, and yet, and yet, people choose to ignore that very, very real contribution. That's not even talking about the intrinsic value of the arts, that's talking about the wider social benefits. So, I don't know what we can do other than just keep going, continue to advocate the benefits, and to continue to engage with our sector, who then in turn, I know, are making the case to their local politicians, be they in the local council, their local MLAs or MPs, and further afield. One of the key challenges we have, obviously, is that the level of investment per head of capita and this is from a Northern Ireland perspective, is significantly lower than what happens in the Republic of Ireland, what happens in Wales, what happens in Scotland, what happens in England. So we really are an outlier here in Northern Ireland in terms of that level of overall investment. And that's something that is a real difficult issue to address and something that would really need to be addressed to make a fundamental change in terms of um, arts and cultural activity and something that really we need to be focusing on. I mean, no, nobody takes theatre seriously enough in this part of the world. It's it's perceived as a kind of hobby, you know, it's some kind of afterthought. It's some, you know, it's it's never given. It's 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 true sort of space and true kind of respect that it deserves, unfortunately. But we struggle on. Our budget was around about fourteen million in 2013-14, to the best of my recollection. It's now down to just over 10. Unless, in my view, there is some significant cash injection into the sector to release some of that pressure that people are facing, then I, I genuinely fear for not only the health of our sector overall, but for particular organisations that may just fall by the wayside. For such a long time, deaf and disabled creatives have been missing from theatre, from television and film. And theatre is a platform where underrepresented groups, underrepresented stories, stories that people uh, really have an impact on people's lives aren't usually heard. But within theatre, it's a place where you can really get those voices out there and those stories out there. So I think it's an incredibly important place in terms of um, changing society and making life better for people and more interesting for people. Dinner competition! Missing cars. Horse training! The Lilliput Company are so open and welcoming. Their um, sense of group and their sense of understanding of each other is incredible. The camaraderie is great and that means you can really work on pieces that involve everybody and give a voice to everybody within the group. Um, incredibly talented and skilled, really enthusiastic performers. If theatre is 
always the same. So if we never had new writing, if we never championed writers from underrepresented groups, if we never cast people that aren't usually seen within theatre, then there won't be any change because all we're seeing is the same thing. It's that kind of echo chamber, isn't it? So I think you have to make a commitment to make that piece of theatre or that piece of art something that will impact on others. Well, Derry has a very, very lively cultural and arts scene going on. And if you want to do something in Derry, just get up and do it. <laughs> People just get up and do it and go ahead and do it. And they don't wait to be given permission or they don't wait for this or wait for that. And I think that's what I really, really like. And, you know, the civil rights movement in Derry as well, you know, people are very, very aware. There's much more um, social and political awareness in Derry than, than, I, than I think in other places. The things that I've wanted to do in my life have aligned very much with how Derry people work and what happens in Derry. For me, coming here and making the theatre that I wanted to make seemed to be more accessible than it would have been in London. Derry City has become renowned as a a cultural destination really and it is on the back of all of the product and content and creative individuals and organizations that we do have within the city and the wider district. Arts and culture play a fundamental role across a range of the economy. Well if you consider the impact it has in terms of people's even mental well-being is uh, of critical importance as is just that feeling of um, inclusion or being part of something that's very special. And that's even before we start going into the box office takings and the impact it really has in terms of bringing visitors and even raising the profile of the city and um, beyond its district boundaries, beyond the boundaries of the island and right into Europe. So I think as a council and even our own councillors are very conscious of the value that arts and culture creates. The work of Soul Purpose has done over the past 25 years has been very beneficial for communities. We've worked with some great people, directors, actors, technicians. None of the work could happen without all those people and all the people that work with us. It's provided, I think, a lot of work for people in the city. So one of the aims of Soul Purpose is that we work with local people, local artists and actors and directors. So how come you can tell me? I'm telling you now. Oh, because I knew you wouldn't want me to go. Oh, Daddy does. He understands. What does he understand? That the baby of the house is moving to the far side of the world. Well, clearly he's lost the run of himself too. He understands why. <laughs> he understands why, does he? Does he understand how far away that is and how long it takes to get there? Worlds Apart was a commission from Soul Purpose, uh, from Pat Byrne, uh, for this 25th anniversary, anniversary festival. Uh, and what Pat wanted to do, they were doing scenes from an inquiry, which is Dave Duggan's play, uh, looking at issues around Bloody Sunday, and Pat wanted to take something, uh, look at issues relating to Bloody Sunday from the Protestant perspective. So uh, I created a play which is Two Sisters, um, who decide that they're, well, one of them decides when the day she gets married that she's going to go and live in Australia. Uh, and what happens then is the, the, the communications between the two sisters over the next 50 years. 12 years now, Mabel, not even a mention of a trip home in the last five. It can't be that long. I always plan. Oh, we all have plans, Mabel. All of us. But plans change, don't they? Life has an unfortunate habit of getting in the way. But why didn't you tell me about Uncle Robert? What was the point, Mabel? Really, what was the point? He's my uncle. Was? Mabel, was your uncle? He's dead now. The IRA killed him. Remember, you went away to get away from all this. As far as you were concerned, he was still alive. Lucky you. You didn't have to face the horror of seeing that twisted car on every newspaper front page or on the news on the television. But as I say, that doesn't last long because there's always another one on the way soon. I don't understand. My attempts are not to basically sit and kind of apportion out blame or what have you. Basically, what I'm trying to do is kind of, you know, open this door, come into this world, this is the world that these people are living in. These are their feelings, rightly or wrongly, these are their, these are their decisions, rightly or wrongly. And, and you look at that and you can critique that accordingly. It allows you to empathise with a group or with a certain set of individuals without having to kind of buy into their world. It takes it away from them personally, which means then that the, the, kind of the, the, the tensions that come with people telling personal stories sort of come back from that. So I, th I think the arts in terms of representing Global issues which we all have in relation to what has happened in Northern Ireland in the last 50 plus years are it's a vital way to tell those stories.
That shouldn't happen. How can they write terrorist when we were all called terrorist here not so long ago? People called you terrorist? Yes. If we traveled across the water to England in the 70s and 80s, the English thought we were terrorists. It doesn't matter if you believed you were Irish or British. If you had an Irish accent, you were a terrorist. Tomorrow's job is to play about the similarities between Irish culture and Arabic cultures. And I'd already been doing a, a lot of work with um, Syrian refugees since 2016, 2017. They were actually teaching local people some basic Arabic. And we had different sessions on Arabic cooking or Arabic literature, singing and dancing, and the Muslim religion. So there was we did workshops on different aspects. And we had Syrian people who came in and and was running these sessions and that would be a way of getting to know local people as well so it's also helping with integration. I help with the organisation, I help with the facilitation and I help with, uh, with the Arabic classes for local Irish people who wanted to only be able to greet the Syrian families and, and to show that they're welcoming them and they're welcome into this new environment. And then we had a closing ceremony in the playhouse and it was lovely, a ceremony of food and dance and music and poetry and, and everything. It was, it, was, it was a beautiful event. And that's how I started my relationship with Pat. The first ship to leave these shores in 1847 was named the Syria. The Syria? This is the name of the ship. Samara's shop was kind of like a time zone where different time zones crossed each other because Derry was one of the main ports um, during the time of the famine. So people that were leaving at that time would cross paths with Syrian refugees who were arriving in Derry now and they would tell each other their stories and they would explore similarities in the cultures. If you go any slower, we will be playing chess. All right, all right, here, there you go. So I sort of came on board as an assistant of hers being culturally appropriate in her not offending any Syrian or any Arab that was going to come and see the play. And that's how Pat works, very conscientious. The music, the dance, the family values that are shared between the two cultures, all that came across in telling the story of refuge I saw how powerful theatre and art can be as a, a positive change factor and can bring things to light where people were not aware of them. There have been moments in rehearsal rooms where I have looked at myself in the context of the half a dozen or so people in the room and said, this is a charmed life. I am very lucky. I got up this morning, had the porridge, helped the kids go to school, came in here, and these folks are taking my words and making beauty of them. The bond between Pat and I as a working bond was one of theatre makers who clearly had an idea that we could benefit from being with each other were better together rather than individually in those, at that time and in those cases, and the work got made. It was the core activity of my artistic practice in that period, uh, and uh, I look back on it with extreme fondness. There's a quote I remember Richard Kearney saying at one time, why use art? Because it's the only thing that can hold almost terrible things that can't be articulated any other way. I suppose for me, Soul Purpose Productions, it's probably one of the most important organisations to come out of the North. Here's a, a, an organisation running for many, many years, gathering the networks, gathering the, you know, the important people that were trying to build peace and reconciliation. I was so excited to be able to work with Soul Purpose Productions because I felt that it was a really important avenue of exploring things that sometimes they're too difficult to explore in any other way. Theatre for social change is not only dealing with the human condition but has chosen deliberately and actively to intervene in wider societal issues, to illuminate those and to try and change the world, to make change happen for the better for people. And that, I think, is what Soul Purpose's mission is about. They're bringing along new works, uh, and they're particularly 
um, giving a platform and a voice to people who maybe haven't always had those voices. That's something to be really proud of, I think. Things like I mentioned before about, you know, we don't say a word, the woman coming up to me afterwards and saying that was my life. There's moments like that that I'm proud of. I'm doing the same thing now that I was doing when I was growing up in North London. <laughs> I'm, I'm making up, making stories and, and uh, making, you know, telling, giving people roles and telling them to do this and that. And, and now I just have to fill out funding applications to make it happen. We do our funding applications, we do our reports, we get some comments at the time from the audiences and then you give that to the funder. But that doesn't really measure the social impact. For example, that, that, that young woman who saw the play Every Move You Make and then went home and was talking to her mother about it, she wouldn't have written on the evaluation form. Like this play about, about um, suicide, you know, there's, I don't know, how can we measure how many young people saw that play and decided, well, actually, maybe I won't take my own life now. We don't know that. We'll never know that. I think there's always that child still there, making up stories to examine what's happening. Maybe I'm doing the same thing now, but we just call it social issues. <laughs>